His victory over sin, his victory over the power of evil, his victory even over death itself. Yet the victory that's his is one that he shares with each and every one of us. And he sends us out to bring this good news to the whole world. Now certainly, we all know that our world is one that desperately needs the message of God's love. That's why it's imperative for us to make sure that we are those messengers who bring out God's message of love and of hope and of new life to all of those, especially those who are discouraged and those who are not seeing any rays of hope in their lives. Easter cards are not very popular these days, but there are enough of them around to raise some questions about what we really think the resurrection is all about. You know, those closing lines of the gospel today said the um, disciples had not yet understood what to rise from the dead meant. And if we look at our Easter cards, what does that tell us? The majority of the cards include some flower arrangements. There might be a, a conventional message about spring, and perhaps it might show a little white rabbit or a little duck or even a chick thrown in here or there. Even religious cards for Easter are suspect. We might see Jesus surrounded by bright light and even Roman soldiers as they're collapsed on the ground around him. As we know, the popular imagination has cultivated any numbers of representations concerning the resurrection that certainly are not entirely biblical in their origin. Ironically, how many of us have ever received an Easter card simply with the depiction of the empty tomb. Yet that empty tomb is what Mary faces when she arrives early in the morning when it was still dark. Seeing that empty tomb, she had a choice. She could run away and never come back again, or she could go and tell the other disciples about this disturbing episode, and together, hopefully, they could try to make sense of what all of this meant. That first Easter morning, there were no big trumpets. There were no blinding lights. There were just some burial claws that they found that had been left behind in the tomb. There's not an angel in John's gospel to carry a message. It's just the disciples, these grim souvenirs of a crucifixion and their own faith wondering what this is all about. What will the disciples make of all these clues? Well, for those of us who are here this morning, the opening prayer certainly provides a fitting petition for the assembly waiting to be born again in the light of Christ's resurrection. What did that opening prayer tell us? It said that we who keep the solemnity of the Lord's resurrection may through the renewal brought by your spirit rise up in the light of life. The empty tomb must be faced by all of us. And we do that each and every week when we recite the creed together as a believing community. In that creed, we not only acknowledge Christ's resurrection, but we also proclaim the resurrection of the body as well, our own bodies that will be raised. When Peter glimpses the empty tomb, those burial cloths are in separate places. That's an important indication that Jesus is rising was not based on a hysterical vision, nor that we can interpret this empty tomb at merely a symbolic level. It is a bodily resurrection that took place. John's Gospel is one that's at pains to show us that this risen Lord is no shadow, is no figment of our imagination. He's not a ghost. He's recognized by his wounds having left the bloody linens behind. Yes, Christ is truly risen. And not only is he risen, he is here among us. May we always then rejoice in and be grateful for that new life that is ours in Christ Jesus. And so let us rejoice and be glad in him.